few just salient facts about TB. Um, so it's an infection, it's a bacteria. Um, it's largely carried in the lungs, although it can spread and cause disease in other parts of the body, but probably 85%, maybe even 90% of TB cases are going to be in the lungs. And, um, and so the lungs are the most important site of TB, especially from a uh, public health uh, standpoint, because that's how it gets transmitted. If somebody has TB in a lymph node, for example, you know, swelling in the neck or under the arm or something, they're not going to transmit that because, you know, that's totally contained. But if it's in the lungs, um, then, uh, you know, that generates cough, you know, like any pneumonia would. And then when it's coughed, it's spread out into the air like that. And, um, and then it's um, when somebody, so it's, you see the top spread by airborne root and droplet nuclei. So droplet nuclei are basically three to five <coughs> micron particles that they're just the right density that they remain buoyant in the air. So when somebody coughs, and I know this sounds not while you're eating pizza, but you know, when somebody coughs and you know, you see sort of visible, you know, stuff come out of their mouth. That's not what infects people. Those things just going to land somewhere and, and nobody gets infected by that. It's the invisible ones that remain suspended in the air and sometimes they can even remain suspended in the air for 30 minutes or more. So a patient with TB can be coughing in a room, especially if it has poor ventilation and closed in area, low light because light can kill the TB germs, then that, that suspension, those droplet nuclei can actually remain airborne for a while they can leave the room and someone can come in later and breathe it in and get the infection. So, um, so that, that's how it's spread. <coughs> um, it's affected by, transmission is affected <laughs> by case characteristics. So some people, and I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here, some people have you know, what we call cavities, which are holes in the lung, and those are highly infectious. There's large number of TB organisms in the cavities, and when people cough, they get into the air in pretty high concentrations, and, and they can be um, highly infectious. Contact characteristics, so what that means is the person who's potentially at risk of getting infected, um, if their defenses are down, for example, if they've got poor nutrition status, if their immune system is, is, is weak or compromised, such as by HIV or immunosuppressive medications that we use a lot of now, TNF inhibitors, steroids, cancer chemotherapy, things like that that can really <clears throat> weaken the immune system, that makes a contact very vulnerable to get TB should they encounter it and breathe it in. Because a lot of us, and again, I have a slide to show this in a second, 90% uh, of us, if we breathe in TB, our immune system will fight it and take care of it and keep it contained. And we may live our whole life with it and never even know we got exposed to it because it's all been contained by the immune system. Um, environmental conditions, and that's, I think, a key thing of what Eric and Herman are going to talk about, which is going to be you know, what the setting is of, some, of that, that the transmission, and it's going to take into account a lot of those other things. So we're in a big room right here. It's well aerated. The light is bright. If I have TB and I'm talking and coughing during this next hour, chances are nobody's going to get it, you know, because of the, the conditions here. Whereas if it was a smaller, more dense, again, poor circulation kind of situation, <coughs> there's going to be a lot higher transmission. Uh, oftentimes transmission takes a little bit of a prolonged exposure of contact as opposed to flu. You know, you can just shake hands and meet somebody and then, you know, 12 hours later you're starting to get a sore throat and running a fever. But, you know, with TB you usually got to spend a little bit of time with people and that's why TB is often spread mostly within a household if you've got a, a case in a household. Um, in fact, we have a case right now uh, in a different part of the state where one of the adults in the family has cavitary tuberculosis and there's two children in the house and both of them have got infected and, and have disease um, from that exposure. Um, um, but you know, in a, in a small enough contact space in a concentrated enough area, transmission can happen very quickly and we, did, we have one very notable case of a highly resistant strain where two guys were just sitting in a car for about 15 minutes with the windows up and transmission occurred right in that short period of time. So, so it, it, you know, those are again examples of environmental conditions and duration of exposure kind of as mentioned already. And most persons infected do not become infected, uh, most person exposed do not become infected. Um, so these uh, droplet nuclei uh, generated when someone coughs or talks, um, we talk about in TB smear positive or smear negative and what that, that's sort of a, um, sort of a marker of the, the, the burden of the infection in that individual. So if somebody coughs and you take a, a sputum sample, 
and you look at it under the microscope, you stain it appropriately, it's cause, called an acid fast stain. You sometimes see the term AFB, acid fast bacilli. Um, and they can see the organisms right there on the smear, on the stain, that's an indicator that there's a large number of the bacteria present um, in the lung and, and, and in the phlegm. So that, that correlates with, um, with a, a higher infectiousness. On the other hand, about one-third of patients are smear negative. So what that means is they cough it out, they have TB, they cough out a sputum sample, you look at it under the microscope, you don't see anything. Um, but you, it's inoculated into a culture media, a liquid and a solid media, and two, three, four, six weeks later, they call you from the lab, they say TB's growing from this specimen. So they have TB, it's cultured in there, it's viable, but it's not so great that you see it on the smear, you have to actually pick it up on the culture, um, which comes a little bit later. Um, and and um, what happens is the breathed in particles, the way we get infected by it is, again, those small droplet nuclei, we breathe them in, they go down, you know, through the airways, uh, trachea, bronchi, multiple divisions, and eventually deposit in the walls of the alveoli, which is where gas exchange takes place. And they have patrolling immune cells that are in those alveoli, and they basically engulf the bacilli like they would anything. They recognize it's foreign, it doesn't belong there. And so those cells engulf the bacilli and try to kill them. And in some cases, they're effective, and they kill it, and the infection is cleared. But in, in other cases, the, uh, the bacilli are basically there's a sort of a, um, an equilibrium reached where the bacilli are not killed, but the immune system contains them. So there's basically viable bacteria, TB bacteria, within that person, but they're contained within the, the macrophages. Um, but, you know, as mentioned, if... That, and that can, that can be present for the whole life of the person and just sit like that. But if that person 20 years later goes on a TNF inhibitor or gets an organ transplant and requires immunosuppression or something like that, that can wake up and those bacilli can start multiplying and then cause an active disease in that person. Um, so, and again, I think we commented on the last comment. And this is just a slide to summarize what happens. So you've got an infectious patient. So no infection um, happens in 70%. So, you know, you've got, you know, a father in the house with, with infection and let's just say 10 people living in the house. Um, seven out of 10 people in that house do not have TB. And when I say infection, that means they weren't exposed. You do a TB test, a uh, skin test, or the, now we have these blood tests, Quantifiron, T-Spot. Um, seven, seven out of 10 of those don't have the infection, even though they were around the person. 30% or three out of the 10 will have the infection. So that means that you do the skin test and you get a welt rising up or you do the blood test and it's positive for a TB infection. So out of this, the next thing you're worried about is does anyone have active tub tuberculosis, active disease, not latent disease? And about 5% of those people are gonna get what we call early progression. So they breathe it in, the bacilli get there, immune system comes in, but the immune system is not enough to contain it and the bacilli right off the bat start multiplying and they disseminate and cause disease or, or, or cause pulmonary disease or disseminated disease. Um, and again, uh, 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 um, the balance of those, 5%, so 95% of it, 95% of people contain it. And that's what goes on for, can go on for months and years. But at some point in about 5% of those people, they're ultimately gonna break down with TB. So this can happen when somebody's 10 years old, when they're 80 years old, and just from the, 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 the aging of the immune system, um, the weakness of the immune system that just comes with age, they can develop TB. So we see TB in older people um, because of that, that fact. And that's just a picture of what TB looks like, uh, very common. Um, we, this is an x-ray, that's the heart in the middle, these are the diaphragms, this is the left side, that's the right side, the stomach is under here and the liver is under here, and, um, and this is the left lung, so you can see a patch here, the lungs should be dark like that, which is all filled with air, but this area here, this patch, that's something abnormal, so where there's supposed to be air, there's something there, and, and, and you can't tell it's TB from looking at it, but you know it's abnormal there. And then on this side, the right side, there's another even bigger area um, that, that's an uh, area of, we call it an infiltrate. Um, so those are abnormal. And, and you, you know, you, can, you can't look at this and say, oh, this is TB. But if this is, say, somebody who's in a household where someone else has active tuberculosis, you're really going to be thinking this is probably TB. So a lot of times it's the situation which is going to make you think of it. 
This is another case of somebody with active tuberculosis, a little bit more extensive throughout the left lung. And see these holes there, those are the cavities. These have large, large numbers of the TB bacteria there. Um, and, um, and this, <coughs> this, uh, this uh, person would be highly infectious. Uh, symptoms of TB, cough, fever, night sweats, fatigue, weight loss, chest pain, and homoptosis, which is coughing up blood. Not everybody has all of these symptoms, but if you ask, most, most people are going to have some of those symptoms. I will say this, about one-third of people have no symptoms at all. In fact, we've just seen two cases in the last one month that had zero symptoms at all. They just got found as part of a contact investigation, and it turned out they had abnormal x-rays like we just saw, one including having, having a cavity, and not a single symptom. Energy was good, appetite was good, they were working full time, no cough, nothing. So about one third of people actually don't have any symptoms despite having the active disease. And this is just from WHO, since we're going to be talking a little globally here, there's a report that comes out every year, Global TB Report, and they address multiple areas. You can easily go on the WHO website, WHO Tuberculosis, just Google that and give you, you can actually download this whole thing. And it'll go country by country by country and tell you what the incidence rate of tuberculosis is um, and a bunch of other stats, drug resistance and all of that. So you can, you can do that and as, as well as some overall totals as well. And again, just some general stats. There's 10.4 million cases a year globally. Um, uh, there's 1.8 million TB deaths, which is more than HIV and malaria. And 480,000 new cases of multidrug resistant TB annually. And the reason that's a big thing nowadays is it's much harder to treat. You have to use other kinds of medications, which are much more toxic, a longer duration of treatment. And um, they're also um, more limited <coughs> supply and costly. And I believe this is my final slide. So just to kind of segue into TB in prisons, TB in prisons may be 100 times higher than in the general population. So, um, and again, you'll probably see, see why that is, um, you know, from uh, Eric and Herman's talk. And up to 25% of a country's TB burden is in the prison. So prisons have sometimes been called amplification centers of TB because you get somebody go in there, they get TB, it's transmitted around, and then they're released into the community, and then TB gets spread into the community. So there's a lot of, lot of work about trying to cut treat it in the prison and thereby decrease the spread into the co community. Good afternoon. Hi. Again, I'm Eric Morgan from the Alabama Department of Public Health. And just a quick introduction. Uh, I actually been with the uh, department for 26 years. Actually, this is my 26 year been with the Alabama Department of Public Health. And throughout my career, I will say this part of my career being finishing um, grad school in public health and actually acquiring this job has been more rewarding to see how uh, working in the prison system and, and making a change throughout the entire state just instead of just one uh, county setting. So what I want to do today, I want to kind of go through what we're looking at just as in Alabama as far as our prison system. Some stuff prior to getting this position, I did not know about our prison system. A lot of things enlightened me when I started this position. So I want to start with um, how many facilities we actually have in Alabama. So there's 15 major facilities, uh, 13 work releases. When you say major facilities, these are, the, this, these are the places where somebody may have a life sentence or a prolonged um, uh, uh, sentence due to some whatever kind of crime. Now when you get into your work releases, these folks are usually transitioning from the major facility back into the, um, the community. Sometimes that's the case, sometimes that's not always easy. Sometimes it's a low-level crime that these folks may be in a work, uh, work facility that usually allow them uh, opportunities to still work in the community and give back while they uh, pay their restitution for their crimes. Okay, and this slide also represents, it just kind of points out the different areas uh, where you see a, uh, a, a correctional facility is located. Um, and like I said, throughout the state now, here recently, this year, because of some budgeting issues and some legislative red tape or whatnot, they are actually about to close one of the facilities. So we're going to be down uh, one major facility in the Airmore County area. Actually, it would be this facility, Draper, is actually closing and they're combining that facility to only three facilities uh, within that uh, county. Okay, Alabama incarceration. just giving you a general idea of what you're looking at of uh, 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 the stats uh, of individual in the prison. Nine, only 
nine percent only rec uh, represent females. Well, we still usually have a, a more large percent rep represent male, ninety-one percent. And this is actually a decrease from last year. It's about, I think, when I last time I checked, it's probably a twenty percent de decrease as our um, criminal justice system here in Alabama has started to uh, release some people with less crime because of overcrowdedness. So that has been an issue. Um, they changing some pro uh, uh, what do you call it uh, um, parole. Uh, uh, protocol where folks can be released earlier. So there's, there's a lot of things that change these um, stats from what it was about a couple of years ago. So it has decreased. Okay, reporting prison cases in Alabama. Of course, you know, uh, I think Dr. Khan may have mentioned it. Any TV case that's diagnosed or a suspect TV case in the prison system uh, well, in, in Alabama is reportable by law. So if, if there is a nursing home, hospital, prison, you name it, school, uh, pharmacy that suspect tuberculosis by law, they have to report that uh, particular case or a uh, suspect to the uh, state of Alabama. And of course, because I'm a, the state prison liaison, usually I get that call from that facility or my office, my state office get that call from that facility and we actually immediately get rolling on it. As like Dr. Khan said, you, in a prison system, you have people who are transferring all the time, transferring from one facility to the next. You have people who are being released. You have people who are still working in the community. So taking all these particular into, uh, into content, it, it, the idea of having a TV suspect and getting this information immediately, it's going to benefit our team, our state, and the general public to make sure we diagnose and contain this disease as it is reported. Okay, reported TV cases, um, you can see from 2010, 2017. Um, I, just a general breakdown, you take a few minutes and look at these stats, uh, a number of cases, and I highlighted the correctional facilities in red. And now, when you get down to 2016, 17, two cases reported in the prison may not seem a lot. and may not seem nothing at all. But let me just tell you someone who works and does this all every day. Two cases feel like a million. Because when you're thinking about a case, one case of TB in the prison system, you have to give it into account of how many people are incarcerated in that prison system. And I can tell you in 2017, one in particular prison was in Bullock County, and this particular this particular prison had over sixteen hundred people. So everybody who were in that facility, and not including employees, had to be screened had to be given a skin test. If the skin tests were positive, actually that, then if they're symptomatic, you go on from there. But my point is, all these folks had to be screened. Now, taking that in consideration, the folks who are just in the prison after we diagnose the case, what about the people who've already transferred to other facilities before we diagnose the case? What about people who, what about the inmates who've already been released, parole, or some sort of release program who were gone now before we diagnose the case. So all these things are very important when we're diagnosing a TB case or identifying a TB case in a prison system. Now we, we have to take all these factors in consideration. Um, now, 2014 was a very busy year. Of course, what made it more simpl sim simple in this situation, most of these cases were from one particular facility. So a lot of these, what you're looking at right there, you're looking at 12 cases, but they're called secondary cases. So usually we only have to do two to three uh, contact investigations depending on the severity or the uh, whether the patient was co uh, contagious, the secondary case or not. But most of those individuals in 2014 was at the same prison, which made them secondary cases. Still a lot of work. Okay, reporting TV cases in. 2017, as I just mentioned, we had two particular cases, Bullock, uh, Bullock County and Donaldson, which is actually located here in Jefferson County, West Jefferson, in Birmingham. And uh, I won't read all this. I'll just give you a few minutes to look and just kind of glass over and see exactly what goes into a case. Uh, some, of the, some, of the some of the information I did leave out um, just because it's just more detail. But as you can see, um, on the left-hand side in Bullock, if you see that includes, um, that should just be inmate, uh, 14 
77. We're talking about inmates only. And, at, and also in Donald, so I'm sorry for that, that oversight. Uh, 1159. So screening all these people and, and screening them in a time, timely manner to make sure that we're stopping the spread of tuberculosis, very time sensitive. And again, this information is not including the information of folks who've already been released or people who've been transferred to other facilities. Of course, those folks have to be transferred, have to be screened as well, because if you have a contact from one of these cases who have not been screened going to another facility, what's your, what's your, uh, wouldn't you think that you're probably going to have maybe an outbreak throughout the state if these folks not properly screened? Because now you got Joe, John Blow going to another facility and he's part of this one of these contact investigations and he's never been screened. So if you don't have someone watching it and paying a close, close attention to these statistics, i.e. me, then you're going to have a problem. Okay? And that's one of the key elements that I want to kind of side, sidebar and talk about that Alabama recognized as far as controlling the spread of tuberculosis in the prison system. One of the key elements was having that one line of communication through the state of Alabama. From the, from the state office, public health department, public health, TB control, to the prison system is having that one line of communication where they can actually report findings or a suspect or whatever relates to TV education, um, uh, TV uh, meetings or whatnot, and report this stuff to the health department. Because prior to 2008, it wasn't done as sufficient as it is now. And I'm not patting myself on the back. Well, I guess I am patting myself on the back. But it wasn't as, 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 as efficient as it is now. And, it, and guys, let me just tell you, it is a very hard job. None of this stuff is easy as far as making sure and that these, these protocols are followed, making sure that suspects are being reported, making sure that every last one of these contacts are being screened, whether they're in this facility or they left or they're in the community now. None of this is easy, but we get the job done. And it's something that we take pride in. It's something that we are tasked to do to protect the public and the state of Alabama as a whole. Okay, inmates currently on preventive therapy, as Dr. Khan mentioned earlier. TB, two stages, you got your latent TB infection, you got active tuberculosis disease. Uh, probably about 87% um, of what we see in the prison is latent TB infection. What we want to do, always continue to prevent active tuberculosis disease. Okay? And the next slide should be a breakdown of every facility in the state of how many uh, inmates who are actually on preventive therapy whether they are on rifampin or INH, they're on some type of preventive therapy to ensure that they do not break down with active tuberculosis disease. And those are the major facilities you're looking at from Bibb, uh, Bullock, Donaldson, Draper, Easterland, uh, a total of 194. And you get over to the work releases, and you can see a total of 29. So all these folks are currently on therapy. So what happens when they are completed that information is forward to my office, and that's something that we recently started uh, back in 2009, because when these guys are on preventive therapy, and once they are released from prison, after they're released, their records are destroyed after seven years. So the recidiv recidiv recidivism rate in Alabama is about 25%, meaning that these guys have a 25% chance of going back to prison, committing the same crime. So that information is sent to my office. So we we'll always have that information if they go back in because once they leave the prison system after seven years, their records is gone. Guess what? All this TV stuff that, they, that they've gone through in prison, it's gone too. And if in the, medical, in the medical world, if it's not documented, it wasn't done. So this is information we're currently keeping. Another resource this tool is used for, this tool is also used to kind of empower the inmates. So once the inmate completes therapy, a copy of this form in the prison system is given to that inmate. Because nine times out of 10, we're probably gonna have a TB case there. So if someone has been prior positive and they present for a screening and they show us this, 
and we don't have to do anything other than screen that, that patient for an x-ray or symptoms to make sure but he, the patient won't have to go through a whole skin test involvement again. So this tool is used for quite a few things and also when, it, when an inmate is released from prison, what we do, if they're released while they're on preventive therapy and have not completed while they're in prison, the public health has to track these folks down and make sure, ensure that there's some type of um, responsibility as far as making sure these guys are completing therapy. And you, if you see, of course, we get the name, date of birth, we get all the pertinent information we need to continue therapy, when the patients start therapy. And we also get where that patient potentially is going to be housed once they leave. Sometimes they give us the right address, sometimes they don't. But whatever is on this document, when that patient, when that inmate is released, we have to follow up. We have to make some type of effort to show them where we're trying to ensure that there's continuity of therapy and trying to make sure this patient finished therapy so we can protect the public. Okay, TB, TB discharge plan is what uh, this form is called, TB, T, just TBDT for short, TB discharge plan. A number of inmate who, inmates who reported for follow-up treatment and care. Now, reported can, can be from DOC, Department of Correction, actually send us the information and saying, hey, John Williams is leaving. Here's his address. Here's what he's taking. Follow up. So you see from 2008 to 2017, you see the number of the folks who actually reported to the health department or who just walked into the health department and say, hey, listen, I was just got out of prison. I was on medicine. I need to finish my therapy. Okay? So you might wonder why are the numbers jumping up and down like that. Sometimes these, remember back in 2004 we had, 2014 we had a TB case. Sometimes that can weigh in on how many people release or how many people release on therapy and sometimes not. It just depends on the year when DOC are releasing folks or folks finishing uh, their sentence. It, 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 Sometimes it has no bearing on whether we had a case or not, but I know definitely between 2012 and 2014, that has a huge bearing on the cases we've had, which we, where we see most, where we had had most of our cases since 2008. Okay, and to continue on with the TB discharge plan, it just shows you the uh, uh, more stats of completion rate, non-compliancy, and we of course we still have a pending stat in 2017. Um, yeah, once they get out, uh, an inmate has a right to refuse therapy if it's not disease. Anyone has that right. Any contact or anyone who presents uh, with a positive skin test, if that x-ray uh, shows no sign of abnormalities as far as active tuberculosis disease, excuse me, that patient has a right to refuse therapy, uh, unfortunately. Okay? So when they, when they are released, they fall in the same category you and I as far as in the free world. While they're in prison, this is not negotiable. And I won't tell you how it's not negotiable, <laughs> but it's not negotiable. So uh, as you can see, we actually we, we are still in the high percentile as far as completion rate, which is good. I think we're going to fall more probably in more in the 70 by towards the fiscal year and this year we should be completed with this pending status, so I think we'll still be in the high completion rate. So actually, overall, over average, we're still doing just as well as the national average when it comes to continuity of therapy for those folks who are released while preventive therapy. One of the things that I have done, I'm a little biased because I have worked in Zambia and live and worked in Zambia for a few years, uh, uh, seven or eight, so some of the data is going to be uh, from Zambia. So, so just to give you an idea, uh, I and mean, it's the, the environments of prisons in African prisons, uh, they're very similar among uh, each other. So it's probably going to be a, a, a kind of a, a global image of what, it, what is the situation. Uh, in 2009, the Zambian tuberculosis prevalence was 160 over 100,000 population was one of the highest. If you compare that with the United States, currently it's 3.5 over 100,000, around that, correct? So it's 3.5 3 over 100,000. So, so to be a high burden country is more than 400 over 100,000 population. So just to give you an idea, that was the Zambian national TB prevalence. Uh, but 
Uh, Lusaka, the capital, whereas usually tuberculosis is concentrated in, in mostly in the most urban areas, in the shanty towns areas, in the peripheral rings of the cities. So, so when they did a study of uh, Helen Ailes uh, uh, from another organization, she did a study, she found extremely high rates uh, in the city, not only among the HIV negative, but also uh, among the HIV positive, to the point that it was 870 over 100,000 population, the overall TB prevalence, but in HIV infected was around 1,600. So it's just basically quite huge in terms of numbers. Uh, so, so just to give you an idea, what is happening inside prisons, and, and this is uh, a random prison. Uh, this is a Russian prison. These are uh, pictures from Michael Kimmerling, who was my mentor many, many years ago, and used to work with Ed as well, uh, and probably some of you, if if you remember, uh, uh, Ashtosh as well. So, so this is what happens. You don't have enough space. There's crowdedness. I mean, and the the considerations of poor ventilation. Uh, or any concept of infection control that you could have uh, an idea, it's just completely destroying these environments. Uh, there is very little that you could plan uh, uh, in terms of uh, infection control, uh, biosafety, or some of those things. Uh, in the in the world, different prisons, different countries, different rates. But definitely, if you see the rates of tuberculosis, by far, as, as Ed says, you have higher rate of tuberculosis in prisons environments than in the community. Uh, African prisons have been basically among the top's highest ones. Uh, in addition to that, Russia is just probably one of the highest uh, in the world for sure, the Russian Federation. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, how much is depending on the efforts and the resources that each country will have uh, to put into their prison's health systems. If your prison's health systems is is weak, then your controls and tuberculosis and HIV and many other diseases are really weak. So, so my personal experience when I when I finished my fellowship in, in infectious diseases, what I did is I was I was uh, I was doing research in biomarkers. I was firing lasers, uh, uh, just trying to find biomarkers for tuberculosis trying to find a new diagnostic uh, tool, uh, uh, very fancy technology that here we have available here at UAB. And I went for one year, and since 30, I was going for one year to Zambia, collect samples, come back, fire the lasers, and publish. Uh, number one, I, st I stayed for seven or eight years. Uh, number two, it's not as simple as that. You could have a perfect technology, and just implementation of that perfect technology is about education not only about education to the community and acceptability into the community, but also about education to the, to the implementers. So if you don't believe in the test that you're providing and putting in there, there's nothing that you will achieve. The other context that is very important in, in developing country uh, uh, prisons health systems is the buying not only of the officers or the people in charge, but the inmate community. And as such, what we create in all the programs that we do is what is called TB peer educator programs. Um, I'm sure there's something similar here, uh, Eric, and, and what, what we do is just educate uh, the inmates uh, that would like to help with the program, that understand, and they create ownership of the program, and they will help with all these uh, action plans and, and implementations. At the end, so there's a cadre of, I remember we trained like 75 inmates. Uh, after transfers and movings and ins and outs, we remained with only five, but those five became in what they called themselves super peers, and they created a structure, and they keep training the rest of the people that was coming in, selecting them. And it's a very interesting system. But anyhow, uh, we tried to get at least one peer for every 50 inmates, but uh, mostly it's depending on how it happens. So, so what happened is, as Eric presented, uh, so this is the counterpart. So nationwide, in, 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 Zambia, in Zambia, there is 86 total number of prisons, with 53, as you will uh, know, as the standard prisons, correct? So cell walls and uh, basically walls around peripheral areas. And there's 33 open air farm prisons, and those are probably the ones that, uh, when inmates are good conduct and um, good behavior, they probably will be before they are released to the community, they go to those, uh, and they could sell those products as well, uh, but they, they are farming. The Zambian's prison total population in 2015, and by now is the same, is around 18,000 inmates. 
It's just I, I was surprised that <clears throat> didn't figure it out that, but Alabama has twenty three thousand, so you could imagine that. So so indeed, one of the biggest or the biggest penitentiary system in the world is the U.S. Yes. in terms of population. That's by far the biggest and the one who spent more money than any other Absolutely. system in the world. But the interesting part in, in Zambian prisons, as many other African prisons, is that you have the, con the, the, um, the proportion of convicts is around 60%, 60 to 65% on average. And the remedies, or the ones who are awaiting a sentence, they are not even guilty. They are basically suspects of committing a crime that were throwing in jail, is about 30 to 35%. There's some juveniles and there's a female population as well. So just, just a little bit of, of what, we, what we consider infection control and uh, how the program went in, in Zambia. Let me just get all this. So when you, when you think about uh, uh, infection control or, or uh, when we thought about this program in Zambia, we, we learned two or three things. Number one, of course there's a prisons uh, and prisons have uh, have a wall, but that wall has like uh, holes or spaces or gaps. Why is that? Because either there is transfers from that cell to another cell, or there is uh, exchange with the prisons camp, which is the workers. So there's constant movement of prisoners in and out of that. It's not like they are secluded in one single environment. So <clears throat> what happened is, as inmates are coming in, they usually go to other prisons, prison staff, daily interactions. Uh, they acquire diseases uh, within the prison system. Sometimes they get TB, sometimes they go out again. And, and whatever they come in or they go out with or they bring back in. So it's mostly prisons what are working is as a concentration or amplification center of any disease. Um, mainly tuberculosis, because what Dr. Khan explained is, is, is one of the main concerns. But also uh, some of the things like HIV, and I will explain you in a few minutes why. So whenever, when we thought about how do we intervene, and there's different points where you could intervene. At entry, within the prison, as a mass screening, at exit, just to, to cut the, the, the going out of the disease, but, or uh, the community that is surrounding the prison. So but if there's two points where you would like to intervene in a prison system, it's mostly at entry. It's like closing the, the faucet or the, uh, or, or the water in, uh, inlet. It's just basically you screen every single inmate that is coming in for tuberculosis in this case, and then over time you will clean up your prison system. Now, if you have money, if you could do further interventions, then definitely a mass screening at the same time will be uh, 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 advisable here. Uh, and ultimately, if you want to also secure the community, is exits. But the most important screenings are entry and mass screenings. So. So what we did in Zambia is we implemented a system, but we needed a tool, and the tool was a container, a container that has half lab and, and half x-ray. The beauty of this is that uh, uh, this, this bus basically did provide us uh, the capacity of fluorescent microscopy, digital x-ray, culture capacity, and drug susceptibility testing, not on, on, the, uh, on that place, but just basically where we send the samples to our lab. Uh, this container was designed specifically by a company but the, the most interesting part is that uh, this is what is half lab and half x-ray. But the most interesting part is this. Uh, so we were doing the smears and the results and the x-rays also, but the x-rays uh, needed interpretation. And whenever they needed to be sent somewhere, we used cell phone networks. And through the cell phone networks, uh, I was mostly interpreting most of the x-rays, but they were reaching me out through my cell phone in different points. And this is a technology that has become very widely available. Uh, why? Because there's no radiologist to interpret x-rays in this environment. In any case, a little bit of an, on the rates of tuberculosis and HIV. So we found in our programs, particularly in this, in this context, the increasing rate of HIV as uh, different screenings, at entry, at mass, and exit. Same as the rates of tuberculosis were considerably increasing uh, from entry to exit. So there is there is the concept of amplification and concentration. And, and tuberculosis, you could say, yes, well, there's crowdedness, there is disease, uh, and then there's transmission. Uh, we have a lot of problems with HIV uh, upon showing this data in the country because uh, uh, Zambia is a country that 
uh, where homosexuality is legal. Uh, there's no condom distributions in prisons. Uh, the acceptability of sex uh, between uh, men is, is illegal, so there's not acceptable. So they said how this is happening. Uh, there's a lot of questions about this data. Uh, but definitely, there is, there is sex in prisons, and, and we did some other studies to show that. One of the other concepts that, that Eric was talking about, continuity of care. Continuity of care in these kind of prisons is very difficult. One of the things that, that frustration that we personally experience is that of our inmates who were diagnosed with TB. And, and just to show you, the total rate of TB in one year of study was 429 cases uh, diagnosed of all the, the ones that we screened. And at the population level, it was 5.4% or 5,400 over 100,000 population. So it's, it, it was tremendously high, the rate. What we look at, and this is mostly concentrating the loss to follow up. So of the patients diagnosed, we thought we were doing a good thing, and, but we were not successful at initiating all of them on treatment. It was very interesting to understand that. How is that possible that you have prisoners that are in cells and then you basically you lose them? Also, uh, when they were transferred out or, or transferred to another facilities, you were losing them. So approximately 40% of the patients uh, uh, around that, we lost them uh, to follow up. So we, are not, we don't know what happened with them. So it was a frustration. Uh, then we implement uh, a new tool, which is basically a molecular technique. It's very modern, uh, endorsed by WHO. It's a PCR, PCR technology in a, in a small format. It's a rapid diagnostic test for tuberculosis. In prison systems, we implement this uh, in different clinics, but, but mostly what it happened is, this is what I said, when you implement a new technology, and we did a lot of tests, we diagnosed a lot of TB, uh, some MDR TB, some rifampicin resistant tests. But if your laboratory cannot assure you that they are going to do further testing, it's just for nothing. Of the 50 cases that were rifampicin resistant, because the technology allows you to say that, we couldn't confirm MDR TB except uh, in, two, in two patients for different reasons on the laboratory which, that was in the national, uh, the national TB laboratory, not ours. So, so unfortunately, only two patients received second line treatment, and, and we don't know exactly how many more should have received those. Uh, so, so with, with, with this, you have a snapshot of the difference between the conditions here, the conditions in, in, in international settings. After this, we did some other studies and some other funding just to strengthen the health system. So my work that I started as a biomarker researcher transform into programmatic implementation of health system strengthening in the prison's environment, which is, which is essentially something that it, it, it came up really nice because now we have an agreement, an MOU of understanding between the different ministries of government, uh, how that is implemented in the country and how that works until now.